I have started recording a few minutes late because I'm running my mouth and I completely forget. And then we get into it and I'm like, loo, 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 having a great time. And then like, oh my God, not recording. So the recordings from the previous two days are all like 10 minutes less. <laughs> so I'm really well, sorry. Imagination. I'm really sorry about that. Yeah, use your, this is the imagination time and you are <laughs> recording now. So this blather will be there for you when you go check it out. Um, oh, and there was one question and I, it may not be um, obvious to you depending on your interface, but the, there's a transcript that is automatically generated. When I send you the recording, there's a transcript and you can see the transcript to the right. The, the recording is uh, kind of center and to the right, you can choose between looking at the actual transcript of what the people are saying. And then you can toggle to the chat and also see everything that was in the chat. So I know um, some people had emailed me with questions, not able to figure out where the transcript was. So that's where it is. It, um, it may look differently on your computer or on your um, web browser, but, uh, and I'm happy to help um, problem shoot if, if you're having issues. Um, so why don't we go ahead and do our Zoom storm? And this is just a way to get everyone to participate, even the shy ones. Um, even the fashionably late ones who are seeing in the chat. So the Zoom storm is, this is how it works. You're gonna type in your answer to the question I ask you. You're not gonna hit send or enter until I say go. And then the chat will populate with uh, just amazing feedback and content and opinions and all of those things, facts, figures. So today I thought the question could be, um, we were, we were talking about this in the chat. We were talking about this as we opened. So why don't we continue this? Uh, why don't either one thing that you've really appreciated about the virtual conference or one thing that um, you would like to see fixed or improved. So you can go super positive, rainbows and lollipops, the thing you love, or you can share to cho to share you can choose to share constructive criticism something that could be fixed and i'll actually scoop all these up and make sure we share them with sharon and all the other people so you've had plenty of warm-up you have your answers typed in on a count of three you're going to hit enter one two three enter All right, I saw the Delaney talk was dope. I'm liking that. The hallway conversations. <laughs> Where are you having hallway conversations, Angela? That's, what hallways are you in? I need to find them. Well, so thank you for um, hallways, yes, and quotes. Thank you for the feedback. I will look through and I promise if there's, uh, there's it's all good, but things that the Croy um, planners need to see, we'll definitely um, put that in there. Be sure to fill out your evals and be sure what in the middle of chats today or in the middle of QA, if you're running into problems, start complaining in the chat. You'll get attention. The chats are highly moderated. So um, don't just be frustrated, complain and, and maybe we can make get things fixed and better. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Intando and Stacy, who are gonna introduce our topic for today in BNABs and our special guest speaker, Marina. So thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you very much, Jim. And uh, you're reminding me why I call you Uncle Jim. You really kept us um, with your charts throughout for about 15, 20 minutes, which I think is very lovely. True Uncle style. And again, really welcome. This is um, uh, one of the great sessions. I mean, uh, the sessions that we have as advocates to really look through the stuff that is happening at Croy. And so, I'd really like to say good morning to all of you that I see are having breakfast and good evening to all those who are having margaritas or afternoon. Um, I'm not sure what uh, uh, midnight and Udom and others who are in the far uh, uh, west are having at this time because it's quite late for them, but really appreciated that we, are, we can be joined uh, in this manner. And again, today we're really talking things broadly neutralizing antibodies and shortly known as uh, BNABs, which we know that they have a lot of potential to contribute to 
the global HIV prevention treatment as well as cure agenda. And I think we had some of that previously. And, you know, BNAPs, as I think most of us know, um, a, a, an, an approach where antibodies are naturally developed. Um, well, I mean, they are really uh, worked out to assist the immune system, which naturally um, is able to really help us to fight a lot of infections. But sometimes we know that the, the virus, uh, especially HIV, evolves faster than the immune system um, and, and, and the antibodies that we nat naturally developed are not really able to, to help uh, fight that. So when that happens, the development of special antibodies really uh, comes into play to really help, at least hopefully, with all of you know either prevention or treatment and i think as i we initially said it can it has potential to help with cure efforts and today we really will be talking about that and we heard about this uh, during the opening plenary and that is where we have one of the speakers to really speak to us i think was it the opening or monday i cannot remember and we also, and I think Stacey is going to introduce all of them to really talk about this. And you can start all the questions that you have about BNAPs. And, and I think one of the things we talk about, at least from HIV prevention uh, a, a perspective, is the, um, the EMP study, which is one of the, of the studies that are quite uh, topical, quite a number of results that we had. And we know this is one of the things that people are really trying to understand what it is. But this, as we know, this session is really an open session, an informal session where we really get to speak about all of this. And I'm going to, at this point, really stop talking and really hand it over to Stacy, who is going to introduce our special guest today. We are really going to take us through this conversation. Over to you, Stacy. All right. Um, I'm really not going to speak for, for long at all. I think um, I'm going to just quickly hand it over to, um, to Marina Caspi, uh, who is with us and is going to provide um, sort of the overview of, um, of the, the BNAB pipeline for us. Um, I think many people probably um, are familiar with Marina, um, even if you've just sort of read the, the CROI program, Marina has a lot of uh, roles in the field. I think the most, um, uh, the one where she spends most of her time is as a clinical professor at Rockefeller University um, here in, or here, not, I'm not here in New York anymore, but in New York, um, at where she's heading up the um, clinical development of some of their BNAB candidates. Um, and uh, is, is, I think we were really excited at AVAC to see, Marina, that you were um, giving the, the plenary on BNABs at CROI um, because you are, I think BNABs tend to be a, somewhat of an inaccessible um, topic for a lot of non-scientists or advocates. Um, and um, at AVAC, we've discovered that there are um, a lot of like hip young researchers out there who are really fun to talk to you about BNAPs and Marina <laughs> is one of those. Um, so excited that you're giving the plenary and also really excited that you're here with us today to give this. Um, I do wanna also quickly say that we also have um, Shelly Karuna here um, very early um, as some of you are from, from the West Coast. And I think many people probably also know Shelly. Um, she is from uh, the HVTN and um, is one of the, the, the lead investigators uh, from the HVTN side um, on the AMP study. So is not gonna give us a, a, an overview at all of AMP, but is definitely here to provide some, some insights on that um, to, to follow on from Marina's overview. So, um, so that's, so Marina, I'll hand it over to you. And I think um, you don't have, you're not going to use slides, correct? Well, I, you know, I just, uh, I just pulled a few slides that I, so okay. I can project so that it, it also helps me uh, get oriented. So let me just do that. Great. Hoping that after a year of Zooming Zoom, I can do this properly. <laughs> because I'm going to have to do it again formally for the plan there. <laughs> All right, you're able to see the, um, my slide, right? 
Yes. Yeah. Great. Okay. Perfect. So Thank you've, you. you know, if, if you've seen me speak, you've seen this picture many, many times. But uh, since the, the topic is uh, what's in the pipeline, I think, well, first, I think that um, in, for all of us in the HIV field, I feel that this year in many ways was um, imposed a pause uh, for us and we had to repurpose of a lot of what we, we were doing um, to, towards COVID. And under that umbrella, we've learned uh, a lot about um, SARS-CoV-2 immune responses. We've seen a lot of monoclonal antibodies move forward really uh, super fast. And then we have a lot of very exciting results from clinical trials with those um, antibodies. So I think I like to think that now we can bring all of that experience, that, that fast-paced experience with neutralizing antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 back to the HIV field and, and, um, and, you know, and learn lessons from those studies. I think that the experience over the last year really expanded our comfort with antibodies as a safe approach uh, to either treat or prevent an infection. Because up to now, really in, in an ID, infectious diseases practice, monoclonal antibodies are really not commonplace as they are for rheumatology and oncology. But I think with SARS-CoV-2, antibodies are some, something that began to be in both practitioners and patients' minds. So I think that we in the HIV field can tag along with that experience. Um, and, but, but of course, you know, the two infections are, are very um, different. With SARS-CoV-2, you, you get antibodies that are highly neutralizing very early after an infection. Uh, whereas for HIV, it really takes a, a while after someone is infected to go on to develop these antibodies. So there are important differences, but I think that uh, we really learned the potential of antibodies uh, this past year. So where we are with uh, HIV. So, so this figure here shows the envelope trimer and uh, the different colors show the different areas on the, on the envelope that have been described as being susceptible to neutralization. And each color uh, list of, of antibodies, they all have these number names for now, um, are antibodies that target those different areas on the envelope. And, you know, this is an older slide. Uh, these are antibodies, all of these antibodies are uh, in the clinic. Now, I added uh, 118, which is an antibody that is not yet in the clinic, is a natural uh, CD4 binding site antibody, which I think uh, we may hear more about going forward because um, it, it's very interesting because it has a different pathway to resistance, meaning the viruses that to become resistant to 118 follow a different pathway than uh, becoming resistant to other CD4 binding site antibodies like VRC01 or 3 bnc So I think, uh, and then there have been experiments in you know, laboratory animals showing that even um, viruses that in, in the in vivo exper experiment became resistant to either 3 bnc or VRC01 could still be suppressed by this antibody. So it'll be interesting to see what, you know, if this particular one really becomes a clinical candidate. Um, so, a lot of all of the, the all the other antibodies have been in the clinic in one way or the other. In general, the the experience with HIV B NABs has shown great safety. I think the AMP study really highlights this because, and, and I'm happy to hear that Shelley is here. You know, AMP, AMP uh, enrolled a few thousand uh, individuals. More than thirty thousand infusions were given. Uh, very infrequently, there were infusion reactions. In general, it was highly. Um, successful in terms of safety. The only safety signal that there has been uh, found to date has was with 1008 um, LS and that uh, where it caused, um, uh, you know, um, local reactogenicity more so than it had been expected. Uh, that I believe now has been uh, um, uh, figured out that it was about a particular uh, uh, portion of the antibody sequence. Uh, I, I'm not sure if there's, there's an idea of bringing this antibody back into the clinic with further modifications or not, but this was the only really of all of these antibodies um, that have had uh, a concern. PGT-121 um, for Gilead, it's, some, it's something that hasn't been out uh, in the public, but uh, there has been a discussion that there was also uh, a signal with uh, their version of PGT-121 uh, that led to, to um, 
modifications in cell counts, but we don't really know the full story there. But otherwise, many studies have, have happened um, in general safety, uh, safe approach. Uh, the various antibodies uh, targeting these different areas on the envelope have shown uh, to decrease viral loads and to have the half-lives that we expected uh, an antibody to have, which is of about two weeks. In terms of antiviral activity, uh, as it would have been expected from what we know with antiretrovirals, uh, one antibody usually leads to, to resistance. So that's why, as it's becoming clear also for COVID, combination of antibody is important. Uh, the half-lives can be really uh, extended by significantly by these uh, so-called LS mutations. And now all of these antibodies that are entering the clinic for HIV contain these mutations. Um, but really what we are um, very excited about is how, how is it that antibodies are different from, from ART? And that really falls under the, the umbrella of can antibodies be used for um, remission approaches? And the reason that we think that they are interesting and they have something to add beyond um, standard ARV is, is because antibodies, not only they have, you know, antibodies are these Y-shaped molecules. The open part of the Y is what recognizes HIV, but the bottom part, which is the FC portion, is the part of the antibody that interacts with the rest of the immune system. And when antibodies do that, they can, for example, um, over here, you can see this figure of uh, an infected cell where it's expressing um, you know, envelope trimers that can then be bound by antibodies. So the antibodies can recognize this. And then by doing so, it sort of tags this infected cell and alerts the immune system that this is a cell that should be destroyed. And then it, you know, it pulls in uh, NK cells, macrophages, et cetera. Um, and then when with viruses that are you know, circulating, antibodies, again, can form these complexes between the virus and the antibodies. And then we know those immune complexes are then picked up by dendritic cells that then can um, boost existing immune responses. So it's, so it's not an inert type of small molecule. It has this ability to really alert the immune system to this challenge. And then, and then so that's the reason why uh, BNABs are being um, considered for, for uh, remission strategies. And there have been very exciting, interesting studies in non-human primates where antibodies were given either doing um, early after infection with SHIV, uh, either alone or in combination with other immune modulators, like either with vaccination or with TLR agonists. And, and in these non-human primate studies, there was, there's been a subset of animals that go on to, to achieve the long-term control. It's not yet well understood what distinguishes the animals that go on to control for a long time versus not, but there's a lot of investigation trying to understand what really distinguishes and what's driving the control so that we can then borrow this knowledge and apply to clinical studies. Um, so, but taking a step back, so, anti so there are many antibodies that have been discovered, many more are, are, um, are uh, being discovered like that 118 that I highlighted. Uh, we know the basic concepts that they are safe, they can lower viral loads, they have good half-lives. So, and, and they have this potential to interact with the immune system. So when we put all of that together, where can antibodies fit? when we're thinking about um, handling HIV. So um, they could, they could uh, have a role in prevention because they are long acting. The LS modifications that extend half-life for a long time may make it possible for the antibodies to be delivered subcutaneously. And then perhaps there is um, saving in costs of, of in implementing such an approach if the delivery is sub-Q. Although the, the AMP study showed that there is acceptance um, to an intravenous infusion. And then perhaps if this intravenous infusion could be only once a year, you would find good accept accept acceptability as well. Uh, because antibodies are um, safe, uh, could they be uh, particularly useful in, in subpopulations or, or different clinical scenarios like mother to child transmission, for example, during a period of breastfeeding? Uh, when we think about antibodies in the context of therapy, um, I think, you know, I could add to, to these two 
uh, subpopulations, you know, so they are long acting. So perhaps they could be a tool to have in, in populations that have challenges with um, being having compliance with daily medication, perhaps um, because they have different mechanisms of resistance, perhaps they could be looked at as, as at yet another class and be used as salvage therapy for individuals that have failed multiple other regimens, or they can they could be paired with other long acting ARVs, for example. As, as you know, the field is in general moving towards uh, delivering ARVs that, um, you know, focusing on ARVs that could be delivered every several months. And then comes the cure strategy that, let, like I said, the reason for to think about BNABs for, for a remission um, is that they, they have the potential to improve existing immune responses and together with other uh, strategies to, to deplete the latent reservoir. Um, of course, we know when we are thinking about uh, being ads in the context of prevention, we have to keep in mind um, the uh, results from the AMP studies, which to me, um, what we learned from the AMP studies is one, you can implement, you can uh, deliver antibodies safely, you can deliver antibodies uh, intravenously, uh, and, then, and then that approach seemed to be very well accepted, at least in the context of clinical trials. Um, the antibodies can prevent infection, if the antibodies are obviously if the viruses that the person is exposed to happens to be sensitive to the antibodies. So I think that that highlights the potential, but it also highlights the biggest challenge, which in the biggest challenge with antibodies when we are comparing antibodies to ARVs is that there is more uh, resistance, uh, pre-existing resistance within a person who is already infected with HIV or circulating um, that viruses that are circulating that one could be exposed to than to certain classes or to many classes of ARVs. So when we are thinking about using BNABs as a safe approach that can be long acting, uh, we have to deal with the, the fact that there is um, more, um, that the breadth of coverage, even though these are broad antibodies, is not as broad uh, as uh, certain uh, ARV classes. So when we're thinking about antibodies, we are really looking at combinations of antibodies. Um, and then this is just, you know, um, so because of all of this background in what has been done in the clinic, what has been found in non-human primate studies, um, I think we, we, like I said, we had this one year hiatus, unfortunately, where a lot of the planned studies had to be delayed but I think that over the next two years, we're going to continue to learn a lot more about uh, the potential of BNABs in the, these different areas. Um, and then here's just a list of various studies uh, where BNABs are being looked at, combinations of BNABs are being looked at as um, to see if they can mediate uh, long-term remission. Uh, this particular list focuses on BNABs in the context of acute infection where, you know, the first two studies, um, BNABs are being given during primary infection as ART is initiated, whereas the last uh, two trials will focus on giving uh, a combination of BNABs to individuals that initiated ART during primary infection, and they would switch over to either switch over to BNABs, which is what the real study uh, is going to look at, or receive the BNABs in combination with uh, ART because it's still one big area of debate as to how to best study BNABs for remission. Is should BNABs be studied during suppressive ART or you need to pause ART and then suppress with BNABs so that you can trigger the BNAB function by having more antigen expression once you remove ARV. Uh, so it's a good thing that different groups are looking at this uh, two different settings. So we can really get a good understanding of uh, how to best utilize uh, BNABs. And when we move on to uh, the use of BNABs during chronic infection, then there is a, another longer list of studies that are either already happening or will begin within this, uh, in the, this year, where antibodies were um, you know, used in combination with romadepsin. Romadepsin was a, was a molecule that we talked about several years ago a lot because it's, a, it's an HDAC inhibitor that can reverse late uh, it has fallen out of favor um, because the reality with the latency reversing agents so far is that none of them reverse latency in vivo sufficiently um, to really 
make a clinical impact. Uh, but these are studies that were uh, done uh, with Olus Solgard with uh, 3BNC, one of the antibodies that we work with. And we are, we are going to be seeing results from these two studies soon. Uh, the first one, Oli already uh, presented some results last year at CROI, and now we're submitting a manuscript. Uh, but for newer approaches, uh, combinations of antibodies are, being, are going to be tested in combination with NATO3, which is a cytokine um, agonist. Again, these two studies are, will look at BNABs plus this immunomodulator in two different situations where the intervention happens under ART suppression or during uh, ART discontinuation. Um, there are also uh, studies looking at uh, BNABs in combination with type 1 interferon or with TLR9, again, to modulate immune responses together with the antibodies. And then there are more complex uh, type of regimens that are being um, considered. So Steve Dix has already uh, a study that is ongoing where the individuals are vaccinated with two different therapeutic vaccines. And then they go on to receive the TLR9 and then they receive the antibodies combined with the TLR9, a portion of the study under ART suppression and a portion of the study after uh, ART is discontinued. And the ACTG is working uh, with Gilead now to, um, to launch another study that looks at the same approach where there is vaccination, BNABs, and a TLR agonist. So again, these are all either just started or planned to happen this year. I, so in two years from now, I think we're gonna be in a position where we'll have accumulated all of this information from all of these early stage clinical trials to really have a good sense if antibodies can really do these uh, interesting uh, things that we believe they can do uh, from preclinical studies in terms of modulation of immune responses and, and interfering in the reservoir. Can this really happen in vivo in a way that it affects uh, virologic control? And if so, which ones are the strategies that are most promising and then that should be taken forward uh, into larger studies? Um, and then, you know, looking forward for things that will maybe coming down the pipeline, like I said, so there is this new uh, CD4 binding site antibody, N new bispecific antibodies are, are being developed. I, I forgot to mention that there is a, one bispecific antibody in the clinic. There is another one that is a tri-specific, so it means that it binds to three different areas on the envelope that is also in the clinic. Both of them have shown to be safe so far, which is really good news because they're different looking molecules. So to know that they're safe, uh, it's very, it's a very important, important first step. And then there's a lot of excitement about delivering antibodies in different ways. Instead of uh, giving the protein, the antibody itself, delivering uh, the antibodies in systems that could self-renew, so to speak. So there is a lot of, so there are AAV vectors. So, so here, you know, it's a virus that carries the, the BNAB sequence that will then be delivered like an immunization, and then the cells are going to go on to produce uh, the specific antibody that that vector carries. And then there's been clinical trials already of two different vectors that, again, show that the, the approach can be safe. The challenge with that approach is reaching high enough level of the antibodies and then having prolonged uh, production of the antibodies because at one point, the body can sort of reject these vectors and then uh, antibody production could then be shut down. And then similarly, their uh, DNA gene transfer um, and uh, B cell engineering. So these are B cells that are modified to produce the specific BNAB of interest. So these are uh, in earlier uh, phase of development, but again, in a few years from now, we may be seeing uh, such approaches coming to the clinic. So, um, you know, going back to these three different areas, I, where we are in terms of prevention, we now have proof of concept that antibody mediated prevention works against sensitive viruses. We have studies showing that uh, virus suppression can be maintained by combinations of antibodies as long as the, those antibodies uh, match, so to speak, with the viruses that a person harbors. Um, they do have advantages because they are a safe class of molecules. And then perhaps another advantage is that they would not be, antibodies would not be selecting for ARV resistance. So if used in the context of prevention, for example, if there are breakthrough infections, there shouldn't be the concern of uh, interfering with a person going on an integrase inhibitor. 
Jupiter, for example. However, we have to deal with the fact that there is pre-existing resistance, both in the context of prevention and therapy. Antibodies so far continue to be of high cost uh, to manufacture, but again, from SARS-CoV-2, we are learning that these costs can be decreased. And then, like I said, there are these, there's these pro promising new technologies of how to deliver antibodies long-term. Uh, for remission, uh, I think it's a very exciting area of scientific investigation. In my view, it's still a very aspirational goal at this point that will likely require combinations of antibodies with something else. Uh, we are basing a lot of the studies that are going to the clinic on the promising results in non-human primate studies. And I really think the next two years will teach us a lot about what antibodies can and cannot do. And then eventually it, uh, these, these uh, long-term delivery system platforms may be applied in the context of remission as well. And I think, yeah, I think that's what I put together. <laughs> Great. Well, that was a whirlwind of, <laughs> of VNAB information um, oh, and hopefully just a, a primer to get us set up to, to um, hear more of, of from the plenary in, in a few minutes. Um, we do we do want to hear to sh hear from hear from Shelley and, and kind of shift to um, maybe sort of some of the kind of the AMP implications and connections with what you presented, but I know um, I do want to just take a, a brief pause because that was such a broad kind of overview and touched on kind of the therapy and cure pieces as well. So I wanted to take um, just a minute to see if people wanted to jump in with questions now. And there were a couple that came through from the, in the chat. Well, let's highlight. Indeed, and we see that there's really a lot of uh conversations happening in the chat, but really, if you'd like to say something, just go ahead. And, and I think one of the very nice things about this is, is, is really the broad, um, uh, I mean, the presentation is really speaking about being apps broadly for all of the, um, you know, either prevention or treatment and many other things that it can do, which I think makes it nice for the varied interest that we have in this group. So please either lift your hand or unmute and say something. I see somebody's hand is up and it is Richard. Please go for it, Richard. Thanks, Nintendo. I just wanted to, this is probably a better question for Gilead, but, but do you know, Marina, if, if they're gonna give up on that, on that PG-121 antibody and shift to their others or will they continue? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if they are, um... You know, they now have 3 bnc and 1074, so they are uh, planning studies with those two antibodies. I don't know what their plans are for PGT-121. Thanks. And maybe while people are um, either formulating or just digesting, there was a question that came through that, um, you know, Marina, I think you spoke to, but um, maybe you could speak a little bit more about um, kind of uh, regimens and dosing and just sort of in general with BNAP, what are we kind of looking at? Um, you know, would we ever sort of get to a place where we could have a single dose or how often um, do we, would we look at kind of needing a, a doses of, of BNAP or what would that sort of, um, you know, kind of treatment regimen look like? You know, I think that with the LS uh, molecules, I think it is uh, reasonable to think that they could be uh, administered every three months subcutaneously or every six months to once a year IV. Um, the challenge really is how many antibodies one really needs. Um, and, and, and so that's why, you know, there's such a great interest in, into these bispecific and tri-specific antibodies, because, you know, if you give two, three antibodies, that's great. You increase your coverage um, of viruses, but you also raise uh, the cost of the, of, the, of the strategy. So if bispecific and tri-specific antibodies are indeed successful, and, but, but the concern there is because they are not, some of them are not normal looking uh, antibodies. It may be that the, our bodies will make 
uh, immune responses against that antibody so that that's going to interfere with their activity and, and how long they will last. Uh, but if there are molecules that are indeed tri-specific uh, that can really have great uh, coverage, then it would be really manufacturing one antibody. So that brings the cost down. Uh, and if they hold the half-life as, a, as a, a regular antibody with a less mutation can, then you could be looking at administering, you know, for three, treatment, for example, every six months or, or every year as an intravenous infusion, for example. Ah. Now, I bet Simon and Michael, Simon is on the real study and Michael is on the ACTG study. They have some questions uh, based on their experiences as committee representatives in those studies. Over to you, Simon and Michael. Simon can go first. So thanks, Marina, fantastic talk. Um, and, and the work that's coming out of your lab is just amazing. <laughs> this is something everybody everybody needs to understand exactly what you're doing because it's cutting edge science that's also based in really exciting case studies. So could you talk about the, the two antibodies that you developed used together, you're hoping will give six month coverage. Can you talk about the case, a couple of cases where people stopped treatment and they had a long response? Right. Without so any Right, so we had um, so we had one study where um, two uh, individuals um, that uh, received th uh, three doses of the antibodies over a course of six weeks uh, after they had discontinued ART, they continued to maintain virus suppression for a very long time. Uh, and now we have in another study another two out of 17 that also continue to maintain suppression beyond a year after we discontinue ART and then beyond having finished um, the antibody dosing. So these, you know, we don't fully understand um, what, what um, happened uh, or if the antibodies were directly, um, you know, the direct cause of this long-term control. Um, in some, so, so I'm talking now about four people. Um, one of them uh, did go on to rebound at about 50 weeks or so in the first study. So in that case, it may be that it was just that very low doses of the antibodies for that particular person were sufficient to continue to maintain suppression for that long. Two other individuals, they had initiated ART early after infection. So were they meant to be post-treatment controllers with or without the antibodies? We don't know. Uh, and that's why we are um, going to be doing Rio together with you and Sarah, uh, where the, the same two antibodies are going to be administered to, to a cohort of, of individuals that uh, were treated during primary infection. Uh, and then the fourth person, um, we know that he continued to maintain suppression beyond uh, a year after discontinuing ART. Unfortunately, we lost contact with him, so we don't know how long that lasted. In all of them, what, so beyond two having initiated ART during primary infection, that may have played a role in the kind of reservoirs that they had or the kind how preserved their immune responses were. Um, all of them, when you study their reservoir, either the reservoir was very clonal, meaning there was a, a you know, large family of the same viruses. And in some of them, the viruses that were within the reservoir were highly mutated. Um, you know, of, of course, everyone has a lot of defective viruses, but in, in some of these four people, um, the viruses were really, even the ones that did not look uh, defective, it was a very hard, it, the lab had a very hard time amplifying these viruses. So it may be that there was something really to do with their reservoir that made them prone to have control, to have controlled, did the antibodies modulate their immune responses or interfere the reservoir in such a way that prevented them from rebound? It's something that we don't know for sure. Um, but, and that's why we are expanding into other studies now. And just a quick Thank question. You. Oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. I just said thank you. That was the perfect explanation. Thanks. And Marina, are the two antibodies that you're talking about, or is it three B three BNC one one seven and ten to seventy four? Right. Yes. 
Okay. okay. Um, that just came up in the chat, so just wanted to clarify. So um, maybe Michael, over to you. Thank you. Um, this may or may not be appropriate to discuss here, but while we're talking about you know the clinical trials for BNABs and other cure interventions, I'm on 5386 and 5374 is the community rep, and 5386 um, does not have a placebo arm, but 5374 does, and so uh, the community feels this is pretty controversial. Um, it, it's a you know it's a pilot study basically. 30 people are going to get the intervention, and 15 are going to be on placebo. Um, so it's not, you know, not very big at all. And the issue is, is it's a really intensive study, lots and lots of visits, um, leukophoresis twice, um, you know, you have to practice safe sex and all this other stuff. And it's really, really tough. And we just feel that at this point, it's just not ethical to put people on a placebo and have them do all of that, you know, and get a, get a saline injected into their arm, unless we think saline solutions have a possibility. Uh, I understand there needs to be a control arm. That is the argument. They're going to be presenting to the community um, later this month, uh, you know, explaining and, and justifying why they feel this is necessary. Now, my personal thing is, if they see, if they see, I mean, we know those people are going to rebound, right? Saline solutions do not cure HIV. No. Um, if if uh, if they see something, if they do it without a placebo arm, they see something, yes, then I can see them doing a larger trial, say, hey, we're really onto something here. Let's let's take it to the next step with a smaller placebo arm. In that, they really would kind of have to do that. But right now, it's it's I don't, I'm just curious what your feelings are about that. Yeah, you know, I have mixed feelings about that. I, I think in a way one could say that their study is already uh, an extension of our observation, our anecdotal observations with a few people. Um, so we could use that argument that we we had these interesting uh, outcomes that we we don't really understand if they were related to the antibody or not. Uh, of course, fifty three seventy four is a, is a more complex study because it involves vaccination, it involves TLR uh, seven, and and so on and so forth. Um, I, I think, and I don't know if Simon wants to talk about it, I think that the investigators, um, you know, at Imperio and, and Oxford came, came with a good solution. Uh, Simon, do you want to explain what, explain what Rio looks like? Sure. So, so the way we got around that, for all the same reasons that you're mentioning, the, the, this commitment to the study meant that we wanted to make sure all participants had access to BNABs at some point. So if you're in the placebo arm of the Rio study, then you roll over to have access to the, uh, the BNABs afterwards uh, as an option. And you could maybe talk to the investigators about whether that would be possible. Uh, and and that, that sort of design, that sort of uh, still randomized, but to immediate or deferred uh, access to uh, to the drug really was also used in the London study for PrEP. So we use it quite often to make sure that the participants do get something uh, if they're driven by the by the um, just by wanting to use the, map, the, the antibody. So you could maybe speak as a community rep, speak to your your investigators to try and work in that design to to immediate versus deferred. Great, there's so much. Thomas, we see you. Udom, we see the questions, and Paul. And in fact, there's a lot more to really talk around this. But we do want to um, uh, hand it over to Shelley and and uh, thank you very much, um, Marina, for this. And and as we can see and hear, the conversation is really important. In fact, you have a compliment that you really made this science uh, accessible to all of us, which I think is one of the ones that we appreciate the most. In fact, another person who makes it uh, very accessible is Shay. Shelly Karuna. And Shelly actually is just open. She's probably not, I don't know, Shelly, how you want to do it. You don't want to do um, a, an opening, rem opening remarks, and then we have some questions or just have questions right away. And perhaps you can see some of the questions that you can take on uh, from, from the chat. Over to you, Shelly. Hi, thanks, Nintendo. 
Um, and thanks, Marina. That was really great. I actually don't think I, I I'm happy to present an overview, um, just kind of I'm talking about it. At, but I think Marina really covered some of the highlights of of AMP in the context, broader context of the field. And given the time that we have and just the rich questions and discussions in this group, I, I, I don't want to I'd rather respond to questions. I think maybe that's a better use of the time. Um, I can respond to one quick question in the chat real quickly, because um, before I started working on broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies, I worked primarily on HIV preventative vaccines. And yes, there are definitely um, vaccine studies, preclinical and clinical um, in the pipeline and, and ongoing to induce broadly neutralizing antibodies through vaccines um, as well. So in addition to um, essentially <clears throat> perhaps making it a little easier on the immune system and bypassing that and just kind of giving people the broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies directly. We are also trying to develop vaccines that will teach our immune systems to make those broadly neutralizing antibodies over time. Yeah. But I'm happy to take questions or just continue the, the really rich conversation that we were, that we were having before too. Whichever, and in fact, and, and, and we can open it up between the two of you as well, because I think there's still some questions. For instance, Udom is asking um, that, you know, if we treat every, everyone very early during, the, during acute infection, we might miss a few elite controllers. So what's the possibility of, uh, of that happening? And um, what, what options do we have? If we don't, and if we don't treat everyone uh, as early as possible, is that ethical? Anyone can. Well, you do want to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I can. So, yeah, go. Oh, sorry, Marina. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. You go ahead. I, I can speak to this in many ways in the context of AMP, but maybe Marina can extend that even more broadly. I, um, I think it's actually quite crucial for our clinical trial participants, and we worked very hard on this in AMP, to facilitate early access to ART um, and, and, and adherence to ART. I mean, it's the really the... <laughs> It's, it's just a responsibility, I think, of, of, of us for people who contribute to our studies. Um, and, and it's an advantage, if you will, that people who are already linked into um, at least a clinical research context can have that linkage to ART um, provision smoothed, hopefully, um, through that you know, access already. Um, in fact, in AMP, we monitored this pretty closely. We had still um, about 70 to 80% of our participants who were linked to ART within the first month after their diagnosis. And keeping in mind that the study evaluated, um, did HIV diagnostic testing monthly. So these folks were um, identified with HIV ideally earlier in the course because they were getting such frequent um, HIV testing and then were actively linked to care and had follow-up with early viral load, CD4 counts, et cetera. Um, uh, throughout the AMP study. So I think that that's a, just a fundamental responsibility. It does also potentially, as, as Marina alluded to, it may set them up to be more likely to be post-treatment controllers. I think we, you know, we see an, an association between early ART initiation and ART adherence um, and post-treatment control, but I think we're still really just learning um, and exploring that. Great. Um, thanks to you both. And clearly, um, I think lots of uh, room for um, sort of advocate, advocate discussion. Um, you know, it seems, it, it, obviously, this is a really, really complex issue. Um, Jessica, I see your hand raised. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to scroll through. Jeff, yeah. Hi, think, thanks, Stace. Um, this is a really great conversation. I'm curious from both Shelly and Marina, how are you thinking about we select BNAPs for the research process and pipeline moving forward, particularly combinations and, and not just these small studies that I think are happening in the US within CURE, but, but for prevention, treatment, and potentially remission studies. And 
and to add into this, how are we thinking about this in a global population as well? Because I think a lot of what we see from AMP is that some BNAPs are going to work in different parts of the world differently. Yeah, I'll start just briefly because I think um, I think it is understandable that we focus primarily on some of the big efficacy questions when we look at these um, large efficacy trials. That's what they're designed to evaluate. But it's just as important to see what kind of foundation and kind of pathway they light for the field. And that's actually what I think is one of the biggest um, kind of takeaways from the AMP study is that we, um, that study was able to um, teach us a little bit more about what we need to look for in a BNAB or confirm what we need to look for in a BNAB or in combinations of monoclonal antibodies for efficacy in different parts of the world. And it um, gave us a laboratory tool to do that. So thinking back, oh my goodness, decades ago now at when viral load was identified as a um, relatively accessible in the sense that it's from blood tool to see kind of where folks were um, in their um, with their with respect to their HIV and how the virus was doing in their body. For us to have that kind of relatively accessible tool to evaluate um, antibodies as a as a potential preventative or treatment or curative agent um, is really a crucial, I think, um, contribution and way of simplifying the work of looking at broadly neutralizing antibodies in the future. We cannot continue, I don't think, to have, you know, five years of 5,000 person trials and expect to arrive at um, identifying new tools in the, with the kind of pace that we, that we want to. Um, so can we simplify that effort by identifying a laboratory tool um, by predicting with modeling or with preclinical data in, in, a, in non-human primates what monoclonal antibodies should move forward so that we can expedite that entire process. Um, and those are some of the things that I think AMP helped us draw um, some, some, lessons, um, some lessons about kind of moving forward. Thanks. Marina, sorry, I don't want to... <laughs> When I take up your time. Yeah, I just saw I just saw your note. <laughs> yeah, no, sorry. Um, we'll just we'll say it here. This is an informal, friendly crowd. Marina's being called into the green room, which is for the plenary. So, <laughs> the, the um, prep room. <laughs> so we probably should let you go. Um, but maybe okay. if you just want to say anything quickly to kind of sign off. Um, but this has been really, really great. Well, I'd like to, to thank you, you, um, AVAC, and really, you know, all, all the compliments and then the, you know, the warmth coming through the chat, it's, it's really very appreciated. And, and, um, and also the com the insightful comments about um, the placebo arms, you know, not, mm. for, not for 5374 in particular, but just in general, I think, you know, it's been interesting and important for me to read the comments and, mm. you know, I will pass along when I can uh, during the various ACTG meetings that we have. Great, great. All right, okay. Um, Bye right. everybody. Thanks Marina, we'll see you soon, bye. Um, let's see, um, Tom, if your hand is still raised, I just want to make sure we, we are getting to you. Um, if you still have a question you wanted to voice. Uh, it was really a, a comment, not, not a question, but um, just uh, to add to the discussion about the placebo arm and the ethical issues. I, I do recognize the ethical issues. Um, my personal perspective as a long-term survivor who has participated uh, in phase one trials that include ATI um, and a placebo arm. I, I think that participants who are informed uh, should have the opportunity to decide for themselves uh, together with their physicians, together with the research team, whether the risks are worth the benefits. Um, at least for now, uh, these kinds of studies are necessary to move the science forward. So, um, I think well informed that they can make sense and be acceptable. Yeah, I think I think that's a that's a really important um, addition to the conversation. I just want um, to add, I just want to make oh, sure that you're very clear that this is a very small pilot study, and yes, if you see something, you have to carry it on, and then yes, you do have to have a placebo arm later. <laughs> Whatever. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I realize we've only got a few minutes left, and um, 
Shelly, you know, this is a little bit of, of my bias, and obviously we've been we've been talking about AMP, but I wondered if maybe we could kind of finish out with you um, giving like a little bit of perspective on AMP and your your thoughts on sort of how it um, it you know, just its implications broadly on on the field. I know that's not a three minute answer, but that's just a top line. And given that we are sort of a group of really engaged advocates, this maybe some perspective on what advocates can can do right now um, in terms of ensuring that the BNAB pipeline advances. And Shelley, I'm sorry to interrupt before. Um, uh, at the end, I just want everyone to know I have a little update on the QA situation that we were talking about during the opening. So if people hold on once Shelley's done with her answer, I have a little update from Donna Jacobson from the Croy Foundation um, or from the Croy Secretariat on what's happening with QA. So go ahead, Shelley, sorry for interrupting. No worries, that's great. You know, honestly, I think um, one of the things I've most appreciated about dialogue with many of you and, and your advocate colleagues throughout AMP and certainly in the last few months has been your um, authenticity and insistence that we remain authentic and honest and that we neither um, overstate nor understate the potential um, implications of these of this work. I think that when you have a study like AMP, the AMP studies that have complicated results. I mean, it's really hard to put these results into words <laughs> at all. Um, and I think that when we have those kinds of results and, and, and when the overall result is there's no efficacy and we're in a time when we are fortunately seeing efficacy of multiple you know, extensions of indications for other medications, medications that have been proven in treatment moving into prevention. And we are seeing a blessed expansion of the prevention toolbox. We need the feedback from you all of, is that enough? You know, it, it, are the options that we have enough I, I my bias is that they aren't, and I'm coming from a lineage of, you know, feminist activism where I'm like, I'm sorry, half a dozen contraception options is not enough for me. That's not enough. We still have unwanted pregnancies, unplanned pregnancies. That's my bias with, with this work as well. And no matter how many options we have, if we haven't identified options that work for everyone over the you know, time in their lives that they want to use these options, then we have more work to do. And so continuing to, you all inspire us. I don't, I don't know if you are aware of how your heart and your engagement inspires us, but it truly does. And if we are headed down the wrong path with exploring this additional tool, then you need to let us know and you will, <laughs> I don't doubt it. Um, but if, you think that we need to continue to explore, then help us put this work in context. I think that this is, um, <laughs> I'm gonna try something out here. Maybe it's a little sizzle, but think about your, um, you know, your early sexual experiences. You kind of were maybe figuring out, okay, this works, this doesn't work. This works, but it damn well better get better than this. That's what I kind of feel like with AMP. This is early sex. This is, mm -hmm. hey, it works and it works with that kind of person, but not with that kind of person. Or it works in this kind of context, but not in that kind of context. This damn well better get better, but I really think it can. And I think that we need you guys to, um, to guide that in some ways, right? To partner with us in that in some ways. You can be like our, um, sexual health educators in a sense and kind of steer, how does this get better? <laughs> you know, um, and, and do that in partnership with us. I think we just complement each other in our, in our, in our efforts. So um, I hope, well, AMP gave me hope, okay, this can work. It also gave me a hell of a lot more work than I wanted to have ahead um, left till we get it to, um, you know, to a kind of pharmacy shelf sort of uh, pharmacy near you. Um, so, 
there we go. Thanks, Sally. I think that that's a great, great way of putting it. Um, and just to say, Danielle put in the chat, it's early for early sex. <laughs> I don't know if she means early in the day or early in the peanut <laughs> field. Oh, Danielle. Um, it's but never a too great early. analogy. <laughs> I'll stick with us. Julie, your hand is still up. I just want to make sure before, and we're over time, but I do want to just make sure that you have a chance to ask a quick question if you want to. Thanks. Uh, sorry about that, Stacey. My Zoom cut out, but I just wanted to say thanks to Shelley for being here and particularly just um, one of the things that came to mind from those great slides from Marina was that so many of these trials involve um, acute infection and that always raises my eyebrows and my hackles thinking about how do we find people with acute infection in settings where maybe HIV testing isn't all that accessible and and I just wanted to plant the seed uh, about that, because I know in my community, I just don't think we see that many people in early infection, um, particularly when we're thinking about communities of color and trying to access folks that way um, for diversity in our trials. And um, and the other thing was just thinking about, you're the perfect person, Shelley, um, this dialogue between cure trials and prevention trials in that um, we think about we don't wanna set people up in prevention trials so that they just roll right into cure trials. I mean, I know that that's a benefit, but it also is something to think about where we wanna be doing the absolute best we can for people in, in prevention trials to take care of them. And, and I know that you all do, I'm a big fan of HVTN obviously, but just planting that seed. I know we've got, Jim wants to tell us something. So thanks again for being here, appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, and I also really appreciate your comments, Shelley. I uh, I have been someone very skeptical of antibodies, and um, I've been you know doing a lot of poo pooing, and I think you helped me sort of contextualize. And yes, a sex analogy is always helpful, Danielle, at any time of the day. Um, but I I think I'm getting it more and more as I'm hearing these great talks by like you and Marina. So thank you. So quick update before we send you to the plenary, where Marina's in the green room getting ready. Um, we got an update from Donna Jacobson from the Croy Secretariat. They have been hearing strongly all the feedback about the QA and the problems with the QA. So one of the things they're gonna to do to make it more transparent is right now you can't see any of the questions that are being asked except for yourself. Those are gonna now be made visible. So we have a better sense of just how many questions are there, how much they, the volume there is, and at least we'll be able to sort of see where we are in the mix and that we're not just sort of being blatantly ignored. Um, so I think feedback, that that happened because we were giving feedback yesterday and complaining and being persistent. Um, so continue to do that. It may still need to be fine tuned and this doesn't necessarily change the case of people only kind of taking questions from people they know. But I also made clear to Donna that that is something that we think is happening or it's kind of a human thing, but we need to address that. So uh, all that to say, Croy is paying attention and wants to improve that feature. So with that said, I'm gonna send you forward with all your questions and all your comments and all of your smarts into these sessions. Thank you to our presenters today, Shelly and Marina. Thank you to Intando and Stacy for pulling this together. And thank you all for being here. And we'll see you and Angelo in the hallways. Bye.